and also Councillor Yacoub. Um, first of all, do we have any apologies for absence? Councillor Headley. Yes, Councillor Headley and Councillor Sullivan will be here shortly. Thank you. Any declarations of interest, apart from those members that may be double-hatted and therefore affected by being county councillors as well? Councillor Sargent. Item 7, Chairman, under uh, council, the council, local council's policy um, on the uh, Nightbridge Parish Council. Thank you. Do I have your permission to sign the minutes of the Cabinet meeting of last week, uh, which will be in your new agendas? All those in favour? Thank you very much. Um, I would now ask us to stand for a minute's silence to commemorate the passing of the Mayor, uh, who sadly died last week. Thank you. Slight change with running order. We are, because of a various things, we're going to move item 14 now to the, the, the top of the agenda, um, which is the local plan issues and option statements of consultation, which is on page 349 to 949 of your agenda packs. Councillor Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, the, <coughs> the issues and options regulation stage is the first step to preparing a new local plan and addresses the long-term vision and objectives of the new local plan, plan before a spatial strategy is finished and detailed policies written. A comprehensive 10-week programme of consultation took place last year from June the 27th through to September the 5th. All the responses have been considered and will be used to help inform the next stage of the local plan, which is called the draft local plan. The statement of consultation <coughs> shows how the comments have been taken into consideration and will be used to inform the preparation of the draft local plan. The statement of consultation also sum summarises the planning team's analysis of the responses and sets out proposed next steps to develop a draft local plan, and you can see this on pages 351 to 362. Enclosure 3 is the schedule of Regulation 18 comments and summarises over 300 plus pages the comments received from members of the public, developers and statutory consultees. I would like to take this opportunity, Mr Chairman, to thank all those people and organisations who took the trouble to engage with the consultation and provided their comments to us. The results from the consultation were presented to an all-member briefing held on January the 25th, not February the 1st, as stated in the report, and the statement of consultation was reviewed in detail by the Prosperity Scrutiny Committee on February the 1st. All the responses have been considered and will be used to help inform the next stage of the local plan. This statement of consultation states how the comments have been taken into consideration and will be used to inform the preparation of the draft local plan. Policy officers will continue 
with the ongoing duty to cooperate and technical evidence liaison with Essex County Council and other statutory authorities for the local plan. We continue, Mr Chairman, to push forward with the development of the draft local plan and we have explored the local development scheme timescales further and therefore we have made significant changes to the local development scheme. I'm pleased to say that our Regulation 18 draft local plan will be prepared this year with consultation targeted for this coming winter. Regulation 19 publication of the local plan including consultation in spring 2025 and this will be followed by the formal submission of the local plan to the Secretary of State by the summer next year. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Councillor Yuku. Thank you. Two years have now passed since this administration discarded a ready-to-go local plan in favour of speculative development. In that time, we have witnessed significant financial losses due to failed planning appeals. Um, we've returned £10 million in regeneration funds to Homes England, and we've received a stern warning from the Secretary of State regarding our dwindling five-year housing land supply, which has now been reduced to a precarious 1.8 years. And what for? It's no secret that the proposed new local plan offers little deviation from the previous one except from, for the substantial additional cost we could have easily avoided. The statement of consultation has yielded no groundbreaking revelations. The majority of residents and stakeholders continue to advocate for more affordable housing with a preference for brownfield development and a staunch commitment to preserving the green belt. Residents also express a desire for increased employment opportunities, improved infrastructure and sustainable transportation alongside any development. Demands that, again, remain consistent over time. While residents emphasise the importance of enhancing biodiversity and achieving net zero goals, they rightfully express concerns about the feasibility of development if these priorities compromise economic viability. Whilst acknowledging the statutory requirements for this consultation statement, it's evident to me that the underlying issues remain largely unchanged. The previous local plan may not have been flawless, but... This current statement before us hasn't revealed anything of, of great significance. I think it is an absolute shame that we have wasted the three million pounds that we had to use towards funding the previous local plan and, and now we're, we're wasting further taxpayer money on something that could have been avoided. Thank you, Councillor Yacoub. Um, I'd probably be more convinced if that was said with any conviction as opposed to writing what was clearly a prepared speech with, a, with very little depth or tangibility to it, but Councillor Rimmer. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, no matter how many times Councillor Yacoub and her party are told that we didn't return £10 million, we just didn't take £10 million, that that £10 million is still on the table for when the timing is right, they don't listen. And they get the numbers wrong on a lot of things, I think. I mean, they're talking about, you know, um, scrapping cinema deals at the cost of 75% of what's given over when they come into power. I mean, they, they come up with um, lunatic plans about youth zones, which would have bankrupted the council. Um, but in terms of... Sorry, I'm speaking now, Councillor Yacoub. <coughs> It's, uh, this isn't a banter chamber, it's a place to do business, Councillor Yacoub. I know you've been absent from this for a while, but can we please have a bit of decorum? Thank you. Uh, what is clear, though, is things have changed. Um, one aspect which has been uh, a focus in the zeitgeist, and we've talked about more in planning as well, is biodiversity. And actually, biodiversity is actually now being taken as seriously as climate change. And, and a lot of authorities are looking at this and, and you know, private companies are looking at it too to think about, not just thinking about carbon net zero, but how do we get to biodiversity loss net zero? And it's quite crucial here that that has actually been brought up. But I think this is a really interesting consultation and it's an interesting set of results. It was really up to date um, and really of the time and showing what people today think in terms of the future of this borough 
and developments in this borough and what they see as interesting. Uh, I, I mean, sustainable transport, more cycling uh, lanes, who, who could not agree with that? Um, and the um, aspects of, you know, a resilient town centre and um, are, are key as well. So I'm actually um, glad that we're moving forward with this. Where I do share some frustration is I think we're stuck with these Blairite planning laws, which are very Stalinist in the way they actually do things. They're very black and white. You either have a local plan or you don't, and it's going to be for 20 years or not, uh, when actually... A lot could have been agreed a lot earlier by both political parties across the spectrum and could have been banked a lot earlier. But we're where we are because there was a Labour plan that was going to rip up people's driveways, confiscate their houses, <laughs> build on Greenbelt, destroy nature and create urban sprawl. And that was totally unforgivable and not what the public wanted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rimmer. Councillor Moore, did you want to wind up? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to respond to one item that uh, the Councillor Yacoub raised, and she said the new local plan is not different to the withdrawn plan. Well, we don't have a new local plan at this point in time. We've just done a consultation on what residents would like in a new local plan. So th that, that's completely wrong. Uh, so um, I'm happy with that. Mr Chairman, can I go to the vote? Thank you, Councillor Moore. The, uh, the uh, recommendation is on page 350 of your agenda packs. Those in favour? Thank you, members. That is unanimous. We now move back to our normal scheduled broadcast, which is item <coughs> five on the agenda, the adoption of the scrap metal licensing policy. And for some bizarre reason, that's me, not the Cabinet Member for Environment, Carbon Reduction and Waste, as it says in the report. Um, this is very much something that's come out of licensing, which you know is one of our quasi-judicial functions, uh, and therefore I am going to defer to the appropriate officer to actually give a, a very broad overview, and also Councillor Lawrence, the Chairman of Licensing, should he wish to add his wise words as part of this particular item. Thank you, Chair. Um, I apologise, I'm a bit cranky tonight, but I'll do my best to throw my voice. So. Uh, this is the uh, local scrap metal dealers licensing policy which is due for review um, and has been out to consultation. It covers the licensing of scrap metal collectors and scrap metal dealers and is designed to ensure that we provide a fair process to those that are making application for scrap metal licenses um, operating within the borough. Uh, it's part of the architecture of the local licensing regulation um, and it sets out the local issues and priorities for Basildon Council. We have been um, subject to review by licensing committee and it has also been out to public consultation. That didn't result in a, in a significant, um, in fact I don't think we had any responses or a very small number of responses, but it's actually a very niche um, activity, so not one that we would expect a huge uh, amount of interest in, in engagement. But um, there's been minimal changes to the policy as it stands largely relating to changes in financial checks, but that's reflected in, it's been reflected in the policy. Um, happy to take any questions from members. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just want to reinforce that. Um, the only changes to the policy is the HMRC uh, tax working um, checks um, and the policies. Uh, we do this policy every five years. Council was not obliged to actually have a policy, um, but you know, best practice is that we do have one. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank the officers for the report and uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Yacoub. No other members have indicated. Oh, Councillor River. No, I just thought on this um, scrap metal, it was quite ironic, really, that we have Councillor Yacoub here tonight. You know, she'd been put on the scrap metal heap, but um, she's now been recycled by the Labour group and she's back again. Um, I understand that there might be other recycling of other former councillors, um, um, but uh, hopefully with this scrap metal licence, uh, we can be careful and a bit more uh, discreet about the level of recycling that goes on and make sure any quality product comes out the other side. Thank you, Councillor Rimmer, and I'm sure we should also be kind. Um, Twenty items. So the, um, we, we have... 
The recommendation on page 25. All those in favour? Thank you, members. That is item five. We move on to item six, which is the empty homes policy and strategy. Councillor Schrader, item pages 71 to 107 of your agenda pack. Thank you, Leader. Uh, this item uh, went to place scrutiny a few weeks ago, where members gave it a good uh, kick about. Uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Gascoigne and the members of the committee for their input. Uh, I also reiterate my thanks to Rachel Glover and her team for the work that they've done on this. Uh, in a nutshell, Leader, uh, the proposal is that we bring in a dedicated member of staff to work with a probate researcher and the owners of empty homes to explore options to bring empty properties back into use. Now, as I advised the Place Scrutiny Committee, uh, there could be any number of reasons why a home is empty. Mostly, they're awaiting the conclusion of probate or have become empty due to bankruptcy, repossession, or something like that. Uh, some have even been abandoned for one reason or another. In such cases, owners may simply be unaware of the different options available to them. So the basic idea here is that the council can try to assist by, for example, looking at an arrangement to rent out the property through our housing solution service, or it may be that an empty homeowner needs support in resolving a probate issue with a view to selling the property on the open market. The bottom line for us as an authority is this. Empty homes have a negative impact on our local neighbourhoods, particularly if they're not uh, properly maintained. We want to explore options with homeowners to encourage them to bring their properties back into use. There are a range of mechanisms uh, that could enable this, including through an agreement to rent. But this project is intended to work through the options. We can't force anyone to do anything, but clearly it's in nobody's interests to have long-term empty properties just sitting about doing nothing. Uh, we'll be looking at a range of mechanisms within our legal powers to address empty homes and set out within the policy an accompanying strategy are, are some, of the, uh, some of the levers available to us. But uh, this will be a pilot scheme to see if we can indeed make a difference. As the report says, every empty home removes a property from the housing market and with it, opportunities for our residents to be housed, first-time buyers to purchase or those looking to progress on the property ladder. So anything we can do to help move the process along to bring empty homes back into use will ultimately help rejuvenate the housing market in Basildon. Uh, thank you, Leader. The recommendations are on page 72. I commend them to Cabinet. I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schrader, as always. Uh, Councillor Coop. Thank you. I mean, you're talking here about conviction. I mean, you don't even have convictions in your own plans. You're continuously pushing things through and exempting them from call-in so that proper scrutiny can't take place. When the opposition calls for emergency motions to be discussed, they're being thrown out because you don't Kansi have... Coop, Kansi Coop, uh, can you talk to the item? Oh, I don't okay. think this... You, oh, sure, sure. You talk and to what Councillor Rimmer said around like the scrap metal policy was speaking to the item. Would you like to, to, the like to talk item? to the item? Thank yeah, you very much. absolutely. The only lunatic here is Councillor Rimmer trying to push through his... Councillor Yacoub, can you stick to the agenda item? Many thanks. It's worrying to see 
that there are 156 vacant homes in Basildon, especially when we know that there is such a pressing need for housing in our borough. However, appointing an empty homes officer at a salary of 53,000 does raise some questions about value for money. While it's acknowledged that an empty homes officer will play a role in identifying um, properties and in, in, in order to establish communication with landlords, I think we need to be clear about the limitations here. They will have no powers of enforcement other than the 100% council tax levy, which we know we've already established is ineffective, and the empty dwelling management orders and compulsory purchase orders, which are both um, costly and in terms of logistics, it can be quite challenging to implement on any significant scale. So are we truly convinced that pouring resources into a single officer um, whose authority will largely be toothless is the best approach here? Thank you for eventually getting to the point, Councillor Goob. It is appreciated. Um, <coughs> nobody else has spoken. I don't know if officers or Councillor Schreider want to respond to that question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, well, I totally agree that, that given the demands on housing at the moment, um, and the fact that we are in a housing crisis, the fact that we have 156 vacant homes um, is concerning. Um, so at the end of the day, I don't disagree materially with anything she says, um, because as I said in my speech, we can't compel anyone to do anything. The levers available to us are limited, but the alternative to what's proposed here is to simply do nothing um, and just let nature continue to take its course in these events. And I think it is worth, um, you know, it's, it's a, this is one member of staff uh, on a, uh, a, a short-term contract. As I say, we're going to be, you know, it's going to be a trial project to see if we can make a difference. It may be that we don't make any difference at all and we determine that it's not, not, not worth pursuing. Um, but I can't really see the point in just sort of accepting the fact that we've got 156 vacant homes if we think there may be levers that we can pull um, to, to try and get some of those back into some kind of gainful use. So, I mean, in terms of the, the limitations and whether or not the, the, the office holder will be toothless, I'll sort of defer to the, um, the officers who may, may have a view on on what they think the options look like. I mean, I ran through some of them in, in fairly broad brush strokes, um, but I think uh, Mr. Brace made, the, made, the good, made a good point at the Place Scrutiny Committee when it was discussed there, which is, as things presently stand, if we have a, a vacant property that is empty and has been empty for a while and is starting to fall into a state of disrepair, which is sometimes is the case, it's quite often um, uh, that the the first point of contact we have with these homeowners <laughs> is at the point at which we're enforcing against them because the property is becoming untidy. Now, that isn't exactly the best foot forward if our first point of contact with them is the point at which we're enforcing against them. So what this officer will enable us to do is to take a much more a softer, more proactive, more collegiate, for want of a better word, approach where we say, okay, look, what are the barriers? What, like I say, in a lot of cases, it is probate and, uh, and, and things like that, which we can possibly assist with. And that will then head off us getting to the point where we're looking at enforcement action because the site's become untidy. But I'll, I'll, I'll defer to any of the officers if they've got anything that they want to add. But I, I think it's worth having a punt. Thank you. I'll, I'll add to that, really. And, and uh, I think, it, just obviously to stress, it is a pilot project. So uh, we've certainly not engaged the services of the probate researcher previously, as far as I'm aware. Um, and uh, certainly it also creates an element of work around the boarding up or having to deal with the, the, the issues for the impacts on the community. So I think that's the other element that we're trying to combat. Um, so yes, I think we said we said one year to two year fixed term contract, and we'll certainly keep it under review um, and provide the feedback to members as to how the uh, project is going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't normally have a, a set of banter, but I am going to say something which I will give Councillor Yacoub the right to reply because I was slightly agog when she starts throwing around salary scales and <coughs> talking about uh, the salary of an officer from a, a member whose group has consistently stood up at council fighting for minimum wage and saying how people should be paid more and everything else. It just seems completely um, inconsistent now 
to A, single out an officer that hasn't even been appointed yet and question the validity or the value in their contract, especially when we know that local government pay scales are pretty much set for the job they do and the roles that they have. Uh, and does this mean that County Coop no longer doesn't believe in the minimum wage or doesn't believe in the fact that people should be paid a fair amount for the job they do? Uh, you do have the option to respond should you wish to, Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's a very, very simple case here of me actually saying, is it worth us appointing this position? I haven't picked on the salary. Um, I don't know since when 53K became minimum wage, um, but I haven't picked on the salary of an officer because A, the officer doesn't exist, B, the position doesn't exist. We're, you're voting here tonight. Um, to create this position, so that's number one. It's in your own report, maybe you should read it. And number two is, I'm talking about whether it's worth and value for money for us as a council to appoint this position and to have it in the first place. Thank you for that clarification, Councillor Yacoub. Um, and of course, I have read it and will continue to read it. Uh, the recommendation, as Councillor Schrader said, is on page 72. All those in favour? Thank you. That is carried. We then move on to item 7, working with local councils policy. This is on page 109 to 139 of the agenda packs. Councillor Sargent. Thank you, Leader. A local councils liaison group was set up some years ago between Basildon Council and the town and parishes of Basildon to work more collaboratively. Quarterly meetings are held with the purpose of discussing and remedying issues that arise, also new policies and consultations. Discussions drifted recently into exploring how we could work closer together to better serve our residents. A Working Together Commission was set up to explore how we could achieve better outcomes. We were shown excellent examples over the country how parishes can run some council services very cost effectively. There are also good examples that exist in our own council. Um, for example, Billericay Town Council took over the old rundown day centre building in Chantry Way and redeveloped it to become a community centre. Ramsden Bell House, they employ a security service, much of the delight of their residents to keep their homes safe. Bowers Gifford funded a handyman service that was really popular. And as of late, Note Bridge Parish Council are tying to the council's CCT system to enhance our CC, uh, the local um, CCT service at Note Bridge. So these projects, large or small, all progressed with buy-in from our residents. The objective of the policy is to bring a more coordinated approach to the exercise and set out how Basildon will support local councils, articulate their ambitions for their communities. I also see this as a two-pronged approach where help and guidance can be gained between the local councils and the principal council for a more prosperous future. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Sargent. Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. Just a quick question on this. Do we have in place any mechanisms that we will use to monitor the progress and evaluate the impact of the policy in terms of the relationship between Basden Council and local parish councils? Yes, there will be monitoring um, in place because those, there's regular meetings taking place and the policy is very clear in what it wants to achieve. So yes, Councillor Coop, there will be monitoring and we will put things in place to ensure that the project is going in the right direction and um, we'll be pleased to bring it back to Council so that they can see the results of the, um, the working together. Thank you. I think that was a fair point from Councillor Yacoub, and in fact, from my point of view, if you've got a Cabinet member that's responsible, then that will actually feed in through the executive function, uh, and of course, having a Cabinet function also means we have scrutiny, and that gives scrutiny the ability to uh, get that sort of information and actually make sure that the policy is working, because ultimately that is the whole point of scrutiny, to um, 
kick the tyres on new policies to make sure they're fit for purpose, to follow through when the policy is reenacted to make sure they're working, and to get feedback and actually provide that feedback to Cabinet to refine and enhance as we go forward. So, absolutely. Councillor Schrader. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, I speak on this item with, with great trepidation because I'm aware that um, the Cabinet member, uh, Councillor Sargent, is herself a very doughty and hard-working uh, parish councillor. Um, and I, I will, of course, be supporting the recommendations as set out in the agenda. Um, and I've worked with, with many parish councillors over the years, and by and large, I think uh, most of them do pretty good job um, unpaid and clearly parish councils do provide a platform for local people to improve their areas um, however co colleagues in the room will be aware that I do have one consistent bugbear with parish councils which means that I shall be voting for recommendation four with a degree of trepidation uh, in 2022 the brand spanking newly created Whitford Town Council held its inaugural elections, they were uncontested. In other words, they weren't elections. We created a new parish council after much persistent lobbying by a number of Whitford residents, and in the event, um, they weren't able to hold elections. So, uh, and, and in fact, last year, uh, one of them resigned and they held a by-election, and again, there was only one candidate, so that was uncontested. Uh, Shotgate Parish Council had elections last year too. They were uncontested. Bowers Gifford and North Benfleet Parish Council uh, 2022, also uncontested. 2021 was a bumpy year. Billericay Town Council uncontested. Great Bursted and South Green Parish Council uncontested. <coughs> Little Bursted Parish Council uncontested. Ramsden Bell House Parish Council uncontested. Ramsden Craze Parish Council <coughs> uncontested. Note Bridge Parish Council uncontested. Um, so the fact is, Leader, we, we have seven parish councils in this borough and none of them have held proper bona fide contested elections in, in some years, in some cases more than a decade. So what I do hope that we can do as part of this policy is work to increase a wider public understanding of and interest in parish councils and the opportunities that exist for residents to make a difference to their community by serving as a parish councillor, uh, because I honestly can't see the point in creating more if people aren't sufficiently interested to see collection to the ones we already have. They clearly do have uh, the potential to add value and to serve a role for their area, but as things stand, I worry they operate in a rather opaque fashion, and of course they're largely unaccountable to the electorate, because if you don't have an election, there's no ability for the residents to give that body any kind of uh, democratic mandate. So I think that it, it, we need to work more effectively with our, our parish councils, but I think also we maybe need to do a bit of a job of work to promote what they do, what they're capable of doing, so that people do want to stand for election to them and they can have properly contested elections that allows them to have that, that degree of uh, uh, electoral uh, legitimacy that at the moment I, uh, is a consistent irritant of mine. Um, I could not possibly vote for a recommendation for without at least making that point, but I will be supporting the recommendations, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Schrader. And I've got to say I, I have a lot of sympathy for what you say. I mean, the other issue to me, and it's something that does need to be addressed, I think, as we go forward, we have been very, very cognizant through the budget setting process and everything else about how we as a responsible council need to set a balanced budget and the financial pressures and the difficult decisions we've had to make. And we've also respected the fact that we have a cost of living crisis, that people are, you know, finding it hard in some places to make ends meet, and therefore any additional tax burden is a problem. And yet we are constrained with the council tax that we set to actually provide these valuable and important services. And yet a parish and town council can set a precept, whatever they want, without any form of real check or due diligence as to how that money is going to be spent or the affordability or anything else. And it just, it just seems completely inconsistent and incongruent to the whole council processes that there isn't these checks and balances. And that is something I think that we should be at least having conversations somewhere uh, to see how legislation can be brought in 
that provides the same level of probity and responsibility on precept setting as we are faced with our council tax setting. But that's just my view. Councillor River. Yes, I, I think I'm, I'm going to strike a note of discord on this, um, but accord with my uh, fellow cabinet member, Councillor Sargent, I hope. Um, I, I actually do feel they're accountable. I mean, you don't, it, just because uh, accountability, when you've got monthly meetings and the members of the public can turn up and actually ask questions of them, makes it accountable. <coughs> and, and that's what's happening in a lot of parish and town councils in this borough. Um, in, in particular, I've, I've got a good experience of Bowers Gifford and North Benfleet Parish Council and how they actually interact with members of the public. Um, no, I, I, I'd also question the legitimacy aspect because notices of elections are posted. People have those vacancies available to stand. Um, it's not, you know, it, it, that doesn't make something illegitimate. People don't stand. It's not Russia where people are being thrown out of windows at the threat of standing. That's actually, <laughs> people are probably generally happy with the service that they're getting, which is a political parish councils. I actually prefer it if no parties are involved with them at all, to be honest with you, um, and that they're just coming from residents who are, it's a nice feeling when you know it's just residents who care about their locality that are dealing with the locality and there's no stupid politics involved, you know, about not making common sense decisions, like putting in a motion to council one moment and then coming up trying to put in a council motion on an emergency basis to reverse it the next. Of course I am. Councillor Councillor Yacoub, it's a pleasure to have you here, but try and behave. Thank you. Um, I have missed you immensely, um, like a hole in the head. Um, we have the item uh, for discussion. Councillor Sargent, do you want to sum up? Thank you, Leader. Um, I thank Councillor uh, Schrader for his comments, and they're quite, they're quite right. What he said is absolutely true, and this is why I think one of the reasons that we do need a policy we do need a way of working together because for too long, um, and, and you've sat on the uh, local council liaison committee, and, that, and that's where my experience is as well, because I've sat on there for quite some time as well. Along, and, and Richard Moore chairs that, um, Councillor Moore chairs that committee now. What we are lacking in is the, um, the parishes and the work streams that it takes on and the delivering of services to the residents. And some of the items that, and, and this has been quite a process that we have been through. You know, as the report is very clear in what it says, all the, the discoveries that we've, um, you know, that have come to light over the year, where the other councils all over the country have been doing certain things, we've been doing certain things ourselves. But this thing with elections is, is pretty bad, and that's why this policy may well set councils on the track to delivering the services and budgeting properly for them, rather than um, you know, a finger in the air as to what the budget is going to be. When I took over the Notebridge Parish Council, I set it up many years ago and when I, I, I got involved and uh, set in 2016, it was because it was in total, total disarray. And I think Councillor Malcolm Buckley that used to um, sit on this council, he was always complaining, particularly about precepts and about non-contested elections. And also what, your, what he, was, he was complaining about as well, is, uh, which is my complaint, is that you've got clerks working, and if you looked at the if, if you looked at the budgets, there's so many administration fees that are being paid to clerks, which are going up and up and up because there's the work as the work streams according to them goes on, but then so does the so does the wage bill. Now, obviously. Um, We've had a few clerks at Notebridge. They've not been successful. So I've 
been acting clerk and, and obviously I don't get paid and we've accumulated quite a sum of money. But that sum of money has been invested in a neighbourhood plan and they are pretty pricey, as I'm sure officers in the know will um, be quite clear on. You need to employ consultants. But it also means that you are involving not only your councillors and steering groups, but you're involving the community. And I think that is another thing that is lacking within parish councils, is that they are not going out, like we do, to the electorate and speaking to them and getting them involved. And that's why I am in favour of this policy, that it will draw to the attention, and it's something that we can work together on, is what can we do together with the principal <coughs> council to get those councils to work in, in, a, better, you know, in a better way <coughs> and a more effective way, cost-effective way. And on the point that you raised, Leader, on you know, the cost of living crisis, yes, you are absolutely right. And, and people do. They bring up the tax all of the time because it is added tax. That money should be there to enhance the services that the people have. It shouldn't be there as um, just to pay a wage bill for a clerk or for unnecessary services. And that's, that's what I hope this, um, this policy aims to achieve. And as we go past the year, as you've said yourself, Leader, this will, this will, you know, it will be written into the minutes and, I, and maybe we can you know, put that into a recommendation that that's one of the things that scrutiny will look at you know, possibly halfway through the year as to how, this, how effective this policy is becoming and how effective our councillors are becoming because that's, um, that's the whole purpose of putting this policy together, that we've got groups of elected people or uncontested elected people that are running services for people that they can benefit from. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sergeant. The recommendation is, that, is on... Yes, thank you. Page 110. All those in favour? I'll be with tribulation. Thank you, members. That is moving on to item 8, financial inclusion and resilience policy. This is on pages 141 to 164 of your agenda packs. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this policy has been scrutinised already by the Scrutiny Commission. It's a policy that was introduced during COVID uh, to ensure that the council uh, leverages its uh, contacts, experience and influence in helping to guide people um, to available financial and practical help, uh, particularly those on low incomes. Um, it will uh, aim to work in, the policy will aim to work in partnership with such organisations as the BBWCVS, the Basil and Billericay Wickford Council for Voluntary Services, will aim to uh, access grant funding where that is available, and it will also aim to work with and create opportunity for local businesses. Um, I think that's pretty much it in a, a nutshell with regard to the broad principles of it, Chairman. <coughs> uh, happily happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. I mean, there has been a repeated lack of progress and innovation in this administration's approach to addressing the cost of living challenges that our residents are facing. This administration has continued to rely on the same tired strategies, resulting in a policy that fails to offer any meaningful solutions to our struggling communities. The reality is that while this administration touts its efforts to signpost support and benefits, or my personal favourite when Councillor Rimmer condescendingly tells residents that they just need to learn to manage their money better, maybe you can put on some lessons after you lose your seat in May, Councillor Rimmer. These actions alone are insufficient in addressing the increasing levels of deprivation in our borough. The only noticeable changes that occur each time this policy is reviewed are the escalating numbers of residents grappling with fuel poverty and plumbing into low discretionary income thresholds. 80 to 90% of households in Friens, St Martins, Pitsy Northwest, Lee Chapel North are in the low discretionary income category. Yet this administration continues to fail in devising any tangible solutions. 
This policy is superficial, and I cannot take it seriously until there is targeted intervention in the most deprived areas of our borough. And when the leader of the council thinks 53,000 is minimum wage, I think we've all got a lot to worry about. And if I thought it was minimum wage, I'm sure you'd be right, Councillor Yaku. But yet again, um, the spin that you put on things and the lack of um, attention you pay to what is being said uh, is just pretty congruent with where you conduct yourself uh, within this uh, this room. Uh, Councillor Schrader. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, well, uh, having served on the uh, Cost of Living Working Group um, with Councillor Yacoub, actually, um, and others, we, we, I, I had a very different experience of it uh, to her, evidently. Um, I'd like to endorse uh, the contents of this report and praise the hard work of our officers, particularly those involved with the cost of living uh, support hub. Um, uh, also, our many uh, community volunteers, I should add, like the, uh, the food banks and, of course, the community supermarkets. Uh, it's also good to hear that the community bus will be coming back in spring. That was uh, very popular and well received. I think that everyone, well, almost everyone, who served on the working group uh, was deeply impressed by the range of support available from this council and by the hard work that was being put in um, by the officers, particularly the outreach workers. Um, this particularly came to a head during the pandemic, uh, but although things have got better in many respects since the pandemic uh, abated, um, obviously other challenges to the community have come along uh, and they continue to emerge through a range of factors, particularly cost of living pressures. Um, so I do think that the council's work in this area remains as important now um, probably than it, as it ever has, um, perhaps even more so. So I wholeheartedly endorse the report um, and obviously any more that we can do in this area is very much to be welcomed. Thank you. No, thank you, Councillor Schreiber. I think it's, it's, it's a good point uh, to, to remind everybody that we did have the, um, the working group on cost of living crisis, which is a cross-party group. Uh, and, of course, were there interventions that could have been suggested? One would have expected the Labour group to have put those forward. But I know that ideas and free thinking are something that is frowned upon in the Labour group currently, which is why they seem to be hemorrhaging members and why they've lost one already to become non-aligned already. And I wonder how many other members will continue to hemorrhage from the Labour group as the full um, impact of Councillor Yacoub's return becomes manifest within that group. Um, but Councillor Rimmer. Uh, thank you, Leader. No, I'm, I actually welcome this too. I, I think Councillor Yacoub has a... She's not just taken <coughs> remarks out of context. She's actually given me words that I didn't say. Um, it's very odd. I mean, I actually worked on a national financial inclusion strategy that got adopted by the Money and Pension Service. Um, and actually, I do know a lot about um, financial guidance and financial inclusion and cost of living crisis and, and what people need in terms of help, in terms of budgeting in all sorts of spheres of life. Um, I've also been involved with working groups in respect to mental health and financial wellness as well and to see how that factors impacts in terms of people's ability to budget. So I, I really wish that the opposition would stop actually um, minimising and being so childish about matters of such severity. These issues are affecting people on a daily basis um, in terms of whether they can actually afford to pay um, for school clothing, whether they can afford to feed themselves as well as their children. And um, you're actually, you know, w minimising it. And it's, not, it's not right. Um, I take that very seriously indeed. Um, but I agree with what Councillor Schrader said. I agree with what Councillor Sullivan has said in terms of about the breadth of services here. And, and the council's playing a good role in terms of curating that and trying to make it low friction in terms of the contact points for it. Because if you, having that wealth of services out there can also be confusing. And you want to go, well, where do I go to first? 
And so actually, when you're already under stress financially, and you're probably already um, you know, vulnerable because of that financial stress, it, it, it's a real service and it ca has to be credited that you can actually give people that pathway to a curated service that will help them most relevantly in their needs. So I, I'll be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Rimmer. Councillor Sergeant. Thank you, Leader. It's all, it's all okay to grandstand at Cabinet about how uh, the Cabinet or the administration are not carrying out their duties um, and there's lots and lots of deprivation and we can shout it from the rooftops, but as my colleague Councillor Rimmer has said, we should not be shouting this from the roo rooftops. We should be doing what we are doing and that's dealing with it. This cost of living crisis is actually under communities in our, in our corporate plan. Owen is the, um, sorry uh, Mr Sparks, um, he heads up the, the cost of living uh, programme and the team that he's had of young, you know, the younger people that are coming out in that bus and will be doing so throughout the summer and doing it so effectively, they, they're getting right in to the communities, going straight into the neighbourhoods. Also, what we are doing is we've got, we've got the, um, the money that we put into our service level agreement for our youth team. We've got some outreach work working in our communities. We know exactly where those communities are. We know the problems that those families suffer. And I've just spoken to Councillor Schrader tonight so that, you know, we will all the time, us Cabinet, we're working together so that on each portfolio we can try as hard as we can to get those families the help that they need so that they don't have to be shouted, have someone shouting from the rooftop that, oh, they should be having free this and free that. You, those people, you know, they've, they've got commitments themselves. They don't want to be in uh, hard up. They don't want any of this. But it's down to us to help them, and help them we will. And as I say, as soon as you know that will go through, it's going through scrutiny, the corporate plan, and we will ensure that those people get the help we need. Obviously, though, the money is not that there that we can give everybody what they want. But at least people are not going totally without. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sergeant. Councillor Sullivan, did you want to wind up? <laughs> <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I thank my uh, Cabinet colleagues for their, their words on this. Um, they, they gave a bit more uh, context to uh, the actual policy that's in the report. Um, just to address some of Councillor Yacoub's uh, points, I think that the fact the existence of this policy is testament to how serious the Council <coughs> takes uh, the difficulties that some people find themselves in the current economic climate. So the fact that we have this policy uh, shows that we are making our best efforts to help alleviate those problems. Um, I would add that we, in the last budget, increased the hardship payments uh, fund by £50,000 um, to assist people uh, who fall behind with their rent. Um, and then we have other tangential policies as well, such as the safe and sound policy, which aims to improve the... Um, the environment of the people where people live as well, which all, all goes towards assisting um, the, uh, their, their general uh, enjoyment of their lives and, and their environment, as well as uh, the financial um, aspect as well, which the policy addresses. Um, but the policy follows the conservative principle of a hand up and not a hand out. It's there to assist and guide people and small businesses to... Uh, um, to other areas that might give them um, help. And I would just uh, f uh, finish by saying that if Councillor Yacoub or any other Labour group think that we should increase financial assistance, then they had their opportunity to do that by um, giving us an alternative budget at the last yeah, budget yeah, meeting yeah, yeah, where yeah, they could yeah, have yeah. told us what to do with the money. That's so other than that, weather. Chairman, um, I'll just can we go to the vote? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sullivan. The recommendation is on page 142. All those in favour? Thank you, members. That is carried. We move on to the culture and creative industry strategy. This is on page 165 to 226 of your agenda packs. Councillor Henry.
Thank you, Leader. Um, this is item nine in the agenda pack, and it is on pages 165 to 226. The cultural and creative industry strategy for Basildon sets out an ambitious vision for culture as a catalyst for positive economic and social transformation of the town. Sitting within the leisure and cultural strategy, it sets a direction of travel, joining together numerous work streams across the council's portfolio from community development, <coughs> health and well-being, economic development, transport, environment and culture under a single shared vision. Basildon Town Centre should be the heart of the borough. Culture and creative industry strategy positions culture as a catalyst and a connector for community and business life, supporting a wider strategy for positive economic and social growth for everyone investing in its future. The strategy is therefore focused on using culture as a powerful tool for the regeneration of the Basildon Town Centre. This is not an art for art's sake, as if the town centre is to succeed, it has to embrace change, to own the big idea, to embrace the narrative and the vision for which differentiates it from its competitors. The associated action plan represents a roadmap for how we will achieve this. Its role is to translate ideas into action. With defined <coughs> responsibilities and resources identified to ensure that the ambition of the strategy lead to tangible outputs and outcomes. The action plan draws on extensive engagement with key stakeholders, local communities setting out priorities against the eight focus areas, the strategy aligned with its vision, principles and tactics. This is not a strategy that the Council can deliver in isolation, but is one that I'm proud that the Council is driving <coughs> alongside our partners and our communities. It will help us to draw further inward investment, drive opportunities for a local creative community, further support the development of the local creative industries and enhance footfall, dwell time and localised spend in the town centre. Our intention is to learn from the associated work taking place in this strategy and to build from Basildon Town Centre to other retail and community hubs throughout the borough. Thank you, members. Thank you, Councillor Henry. <coughs> Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. Um, look, I'm going to begin, Councillor Bagger, by asking you to take control of this chamber and to have consistency in your rules, because I have had enough of the attacks that I have I have received from Councillor Rimmer, in which you have not stopped him from speaking, shouting out, and not speaking to the agenda. It needs to be one rule for all members, because otherwise, this is turning into a very misogynistic bashing, which I will not accept. Full council was held in the middle of half term, and there is no surprise there, because why would middle-aged white men care about mothers who have children who are off from school during half term. Racist as well. Okay. Coop, first of all, stick to the agenda. Secondly, yeah. um, I am not going Councillor to. Councillor Baggett, you need to ask Councillor, Councillor Rimmer, Rimmer, Rimmer to stick to the agenda. You need to you ask Councillor are... Rimmer to behave. Please behave. Please behave. Councillor Rimmer, you, you, you need, you, Councillor you, Baggett, you, you need wave, to. You wave, you the, need to you wave the motherhood, you wave the motherhood own flag. Cabinet members you wave the motherhood who flag as if it is some sort of. You wave the motherhood flag as if it is some sort of um, misogynistic chamber here that has got nothing in but disrespect for women, which is fundamentally untrue. Uh, you use motherhood as some sort of excuse. I would remind you that as a single parent, I have a child. I, my child also goes to school. Therefore, I could have been unavailable during half term. But that's the difference in priorities. I chose to prioritise the benefit of the council and the residents of this council by ensuring that I was present to ensure a balanced budget was set on behalf of this council, because as leader of the group, I have an obligation to do so. <laughs> now, if you feel that as a mother, your priorities are elsewhere, I respect that. But then you should also respect your group, and at the very least, you could have asked any one of your group to have presented a budget on your behalf. Uh, if you were even remotely uh, working as a leader, you would have a shadow cabinet, and therefore you would expect to have a shadow cabinet member for resources who could have actually presented a budget to the people Councilor and shown Becker, the people Becker, do what you expected to, to, to do at full council. What I need you uh, to do is take control of your member 
that would have then reinforced the fact that when you put out leaflets currently showing and telling the electorate blatant lies about the policies you're going to enact when you haven't actually costed it or actually presented a budget allowing you to do it. So we're not going to take any lectures from you, you and this? your false narrative, Councillor Yacoub. Uh, I would ask you now, we have an item here, please try, I know it's very difficult, but try and actually speak to the agenda. Thank you. Councillor Bagger and Councillor Rimmer, the way that you've behaved in this chamber is incredibly misogynistic and incredibly disrespectful. Thank you, Councillor Yacoub. I presume that's. I presume that's. I, pres I presume, Councillor Yacoub, that, that you have nothing to add to this item, and therefore we will move to members that do have something to add to this item. Councillor Rimmer. And of course, he is now going to not be speaking. I will speak to the agenda item. Councillor Rimmer, please don't attack Councillor Yacoub who is very sensitive and, and, and deserving of our respect. There we go, as is, calling women as is, sensitive when they is, speak up to say that what we're doing single, is absolutely unacceptable. As is every single member of this, as is every single member Here of this we go. chamber. Misogyny so, 101. Thank you. Misogyny 101. When a woman stands up for her... So, moving back to the agenda item, um, I'm, I'm going to talk to the draft culture and creative industry strategy, if I may. Um, I actually think this is a great paper. Um, and obviously, um, we can see that with the murals that are in the town centre. And there's an element of AR with those that you can actually scan them with your phone and they start moving and all sorts. And it's quite interesting in that aspect. But we've got that arts culture grant as well for the creative digital tech hub. And obviously, we're looking to create um, you know, uh, something very special there um, that is actually going to potentially create pop-up businesses, uh, new enterprises, new entrepreneurs um, in that creative tech space and create this creative tech town. Um, it was, you know, um, you're not... Um, I, some people have taken my words out of context or changed them. I think some newspapers have done so recently and I've been quoted as wanting to turn uh, Baselin into Berlin. Uh, but I think I was just saying there's some examples there that we could actually look at in terms of where we could actually transform um, the town centre in terms of creative tech enterprise um, to create that creative tech town. Um, so I'm uh, very excited about this and happy to um, endorse this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rimmer. I would, I would actually endorse you, sir. I think this is this shows a breadth of vision for what we want within the within the borough. Um, for a long time, culture was uh, under all sorts of different political spectrums, quite actually hidden, if you like, as far as a as a priority. And even in this time where we are actually having to cut our cloth accordingly, I think it's important that we recognise the benefits that having a cultural and creative strategy can bring both to the economy, to people uh, in general and to communities. So I think it is something to be applauded. And for the record, um, Councillor Yacoub will be familiar. We do have a standards policy. I think that she has actually in fact um, been a, a recipient of a finding from the standards board itself. So she feels that I've been misogynistic in any particular way. Uh, we have officers here and we have members here. Please feel free to put in a standards complaint about me and I'll be very happy to respond to that complaint for any uh, claims that she wishes to make, which she's totally entitled to do as a member. I've not got anybody else wishing to speak, so I'll get Councillor Henry to wind up. Thank you, Leader. I just want to um, check with the Principal Officer to see if there's anything that he would like to add before we take it to the vote? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes, um, I'm pleased to be able to have brought this here today. It's been uh, much work over many years, working with numerous partners and across different service areas. Um, I um, think the organisation should be very proud of the difference we're seeing now in uh, cultural opportunities in and around the borough, and we really hope that um, the this strategy, should it be adopted tonight, can really drive um, forward the cultural opportunities, specifically uh, in Basildon Town Centre and learning further and wider all around the borough. From there, working with numerous partners, um, most pertinently our uh, 
very grateful for our colleagues at the Arts Council who continue to see us as a priority place for their support and investment. So, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, I would like to, to, to thank Grant and Jim Sims and all of our other officers that have been involved in this and also the, the countless different organisations that we've met with over the period of time that this has been rattling around. Um, it's nice to actually get it to, to Cabinet. We did take it to place, uh, no, I um, can't remember. We took it to a scrutiny committee um, a few weeks ago as well. Um, so the recommendation is on page 165. Thank you, Leader. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you, members. We move to item 10, the designation of parks and countryside sites. This is on page 227 to 251 of the agenda pack. And again, this is Councillor Henry. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm not going to go on terribly, terribly much about this, but there were a few points I did want to pull out of this report. Um, and, and preface it by, by saying that the Council's Corporate Plan 2327 includes a commitment to continue to enhance the boroughs, parks and open spaces in order to improve the quality of life for residents. Um, and this follows a consultation with Natural England, which has identified um, several areas across the borough. Um, those areas are Giddings, Copse in Wickford, Nevendon Bushes in Burnt Mills, Oak Bridge Nature Reserve in Crouch, Norsey Meadow in Billericay, St Nicholas Church Hills in Landon, Cranes Farm Nature, Rezone, uh, Nature Zone, which is at the rear of um, Friens, and Beauchamp's Meadow, which is also in Wickford. Um, many of these sites, or some of these sites, are already considered to and probably referred to as local nature reserves, um, but they don't actually have any proper standing. Um, Local nature reserves are a statutory designation made under Section 21 of the National Parks and Access to Country Side Act 1949 by principal local authorities. Natural England's Accessible Natural Green Space Standards recommends at least one hectare of statutory local nature reserves should be provided for 1,000 population. In 2021, it was estimated that the population of Basildon was 187,600, therefore requiring of us that we have 187,600 hectares of land designated as a local nature reserve. We are some considerable distance off that um, at 113, and tonight's, um, <coughs> tonight's paper will take us considerably closer to that. Um, the designation to LNR status will offer protection against future development of the seven sites, but could also prevent opportunities or present opportunities to designate further um, development of uh, further sites such as LNRs and potentially um, sites of specific scientific interest. The designation as a local nature reserve will ensure that they are managed in a manner which is sympathetic to wildlife in order to maintain good habitats and in turn retain their status as LNRs. Am I boring you? No, not at all. Good, good. Um, this will enable the Council to apply a consistent approach to the management of parks in LNR designation. Um, it will also possibly present us with an opportunity to draw down funding and, and various other aspects. Um, it meets and it works hand in hand with our Biodiversity Action Plan which we brought to Cabinet um, some time ago and it meets the general aim of the plan, aim one, and also the Urban Action Plan. Um, as part of the work the definition of parks and countryside sites. As part of the work, a review has been undertaken of all of our parks and countryside sites within the borough, and there are a vast number of parks, and historically definitions allocated to each of these sites do not accurately necessarily reflect the management or the use. So on park sites and town park sites, um, the designations are set out on page 229. In addition to those um, local nature reserves, Town parks, there are five main towns within the borough, Basildon, Billericay, Landon, Pitsy, and Wickford. Only four of these towns have a designated town park, and this paper aims to change that. Um, what that will do is that will then mean that Landon Victoria Park will be designated as a town park and will be treated um, accordingly. Um, the recommendations, leader, are on pages 227 and flow into 228. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Councillor Yacoub.
Thank you. Councillor Schreiber. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I just want to praise uh, Councillor Henry for the work he and his officers have done on this. Uh, as a former Langdon resident myself, I have to say I'm pleased uh, in particular to see Victoria Park formally designated as what it has always been, which is the, uh, the, the town park for Langdon. It's long overdue recognition that gives Victoria Park parity of esteem with our other town parks like Gloucester Park and Lake Meadows. It's also gratifying to see Norsey Meadow recognised as a local nature reserve. I think this underscores uh, this administration's commitment to protect wildlife sites and wildlife corridors and our residents, uh, we know, <coughs> hugely value their open spaces and it's vitally important that we support them across the borough. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Schrader. Councillor, sorry, sorry, Councillor Sergeant. Thank you, Leader. I too um, welcome this report and give thanks to Councillor Henry for the work that's been done on protecting those areas that's most important to not, not just the council but our <coughs> residents. These places are very, very widely used by residents. But not only that, a number of them are also um, have the help of volunteers. They, they go in as groups, maintain them, and um, it saves the council. They work along with council officers, and I had the pleasure in attending um, a recognition day last year with Councillor Henry, where all the volunteers came along that, that do most of the, you know, the volunteering within these kinds of areas. Because without them, you know, at least they go in and clear up the rubble, clear the ponds out, do all that kind of stuff. So I mean. This is something that we should be really proud of. It, it, you know, we've now protected those areas, and it's obviously it's great for me because I live in an area where there is a nature reserve, and the beauty of it for us is is that we can now put in our neighbourhood plan that we have a designated no bridge nature reserve. So thank you, Councillor Henry. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Sergeant. Councillor Rowe. <laughs> This is also quite poignant for me as well because where we're going into the policy and talking about rewilding, I just remember my former late colleague Luke and how he brought in the pollinator policy and some of this is obviously a continuation of that and, and it is nice to see in our parks now areas that have been set aside for insect life and pollinators <coughs> in particular. Um, we've seen that in the Jubilee Park next to Northlands Park as well, in a special area there, and the signage going up. And I think it's good to see this continuation of this throughout the borough. Thank you, Councillor Rimmer. Um, we have another speaker, Councillor Henry. Would you like to wind up? Thank you, <coughs> Leader. And I, I thank members for their, their um, lovely comments about the work that our officers have done on this. I do want to um, acknowledge, um, as Councillor Sargent has said, the incredible work and incredible dedication of our volunteers that, that, that run our parks and work in our parks and are so collaborative with us as, as councillors, as cabinet members and with our officers. Um, we genuinely couldn't do it without them. Um, their determination and their commitment to their local area and their passion for doing it is amazing. They, like our officers, are out in all weathers. Um, quite often dragging grandchildren along um, for the ride as well. Um, in particular, I do want to thank my officer team, my parks team. Um, we have uh, Rob, Glenn, Ian, Tracy, and Josh in particular. And, and also um, Mr. Paul Brace for, for recruiting and, and giving me one of the best teams I've ever worked with, ever, in any capacity. So a huge thank you. Um, the recommendations, uh, leader, are on page 227 um, to 228. Thank you. All those in favour? Thank you, members. We move to item 11, the grounds maintenance service, future options. Councillor Blake. <coughs> Thank you, leader. Uh, before I go into this, I just want to say a, a, a few words, and I don't wish to embarrass, embarrass the officer at all, but um, I work with uh, Paul Brace now for... Oh, too many years here, probably say, but um, uh, for a long period of time, worked very, very closely with him, 
Um, people say you shouldn't have a member officer of friendship, uh, and I accept there's always got to be that distance, but if, if you're going to have one, then I think that we've got it and had it. Um, and I have to say, when he's gone, and when I may have gone, uh, we, I, I'm sure we'll continue to have that relationship. Uh, um, it's, we doesn't mean to say that it's been an easy run for us. We've had our moments where we've, uh, we've challenged each other quite considerably, and that goes back to the distance uh, when we had Gary Edwards here as well. So it's been an, a marvellous uh, working relationship, a uh, very professional relationship, um, and probably one of the best officers I, I've certainly ever worked with. Uh, um, by, by, by a long score. That's no disrespect to any officers, I have to say. And we've got some great ones coming up before. I better get that bit in. Um, even when I have to go on holiday, I try to get away from him, though. So I do need a break every now and again. I go to Villa Moore, and there he is. So we, uh, he was with his family, and I was with the lads. But, you know, we did meet up and have a, uh, have, a, have a little chat. So it's been great. Whereas most blokes, sometimes they send each other things they really shouldn't do on WhatsApp. Paul and I, very sadly, send you things like pictures of rib, rib of beef before they cook it or after they cook it for Sunday dinner. So we've got quite a sad relationship when it comes to that. But just want to put it on record, my, my thanks, tremendous thanks for, for him. I know he's still here for a while. It's my last chance to say thank you publicly for it. Uh, and I, I, I say I can't, couldn't have wished for a better officer with the support that you've given me. Um, as, as well as my wife, actually. Yeah, and I think you've, you've said before there's two, two council, there was two councillor Blakes, there was a nice one, and there was me. So, um, so she appreciated that. So I just want to keep that on record before I go into the, the minute at the moment I wanted to. OK, I'll get on to the serious business now, although it was quite serious. Um, this, this report uh, details the work that has been undertaken to date towards the future of Blazers and Ground Maintenance Service. Following two rounds of discovery with members, the residents and the parish and village councils, an officer and cross-party working group was established to look at the future options for the service. This report includes the revised specification which these groups have been working on and the options which the working group have recommended to take forward for detailed cost analysis. This specification was reviewed and approached endorsed by the Place Scrutiny Committee following work to establish the detailed service, delivery models and cost, cost works. There will be further reports to future cabinet meetings to decide upon a delivery method moving forward. The existing services will run until the end of March 2026. The key elements within the revised specification are increased flexibility over services deployment, increased hedge and shrub bed, uh, bed work, clarity over what is required from service, increased climate change and biodiversity commitments, removal of weeds, obstacles and seeding trees, the options for village and parish councils to enhance the work if required. The member working group has asked for this specification, uh, if agreed, to be taken forward and looked at the following ways of delivering this service. Contracted out, in-house via direct services organisation, in-house via local authority trading company. The member working group is scheduled to meet again to discuss any feedback from Cabinet and the next steps towards uh, delivering the grounds maintenance service for the future. The item, is, the item is seeking endorsement for the revised specification and the options for the delivery of the service and for the specification to be fully costed against each of, this, of these proposed methods with future results likely to be brought back to the Cabinet. One of the things I want to emphasise on that, when we look about the increased flexibility, climate change is, 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 is really affecting us all. Uh, I actually believe we were hoping to start doing the first grass cut in March uh, because last year what happened was by the time it got there in, in April, it was really quite long. The grass was quite long and it made it the, the first couple of cuts really look like it wasn't doing much. So we decided we'd try and look at doing it in March. You can't get your own lawnmower on your back gardens at the moment, let alone trying to get the things that we've got. Oh, that's Stuart Sullivan, might. No, yeah. So that's the problems we've got. So already we come up against obstacles, which is really what we, we're asking for, increased flexibility in service, and that, that's where this will come into it. We've already got a lot better closer working with show, working with, show, ship with them at the moment, and it has improved over the last mm, six, seven months, maybe eight months now, uh, where there's been a lot more negotiations and talking with them. Uh, so uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Councillor Blake. Councillor Yacoub. Thank you, Councillor Blake. Um, are you able to tell us and clarify the extent of work that our current contractor has undertaken for tasks falling under the Essex County Council's remit? And specifically, <laughs> how much funding are we currently not recouping that should rightfully be charged to Essex County Council? Well, I will say this is... Um, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that your, your members on the working group haven't fed back to you. Uh, because that's one of the specific things I actually mentioned on several times uh, that we're, we're doing work for, for County Council uh, and, and we're not getting the, the, the bucks for it. 
Um, and I've raised it with the Cabinet Member concerned at, at County, and I've raised it on more than one occasion on those actual meetings themselves, saying we have to make a decision. We either say to County, you're going to deliver this. Um, if you're not, we're not going to deliver it, and you're the ones who are going to cop the responsibility for it and, and get the flack for it. At the moment, it's with a lot of places in the, in the borough that, that, that look untidy and look like it's our responsibility, and it's not. It's been County. Uh, so that is something that's high. So, sorry, I'm speaking. I don't interrupt you. I don't expect you to interrupt me. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, we are looking into that. Uh, we did, did act with it within the, the working party, as I said, uh, and it's something high, high on my agenda. Thank you. But do you have the figures, or do officers have the figures? Thank you, Leader. They, uh, they are being worked on as part of what the working group are working on for the bill of quantities that will come out for the next part of this. Uh, they, they, are, they are being uh, mapped as we speak. So, yeah. You happy with the answer, Councillor Yuko? Thank you. And see, uh, Councillor Rimmer. So, sorry, oh, Councillor Blake. I just wanted to check. Um, did the was it the last administration that actually made a cut in this budget and decided that they were going to reduce the amount of grass cuts that were done, and then um, and, and perhaps they acted too quickly with obviously the long-term prospects of climate change. You are absolutely correct. Councillor Blake, do you want to wind up? I'm happy to go straight to the vote. The recommendation is on page 254 of your agenda packs. Those in favour? Thank you, members. We move on to item 12, the Bazardon Sporting Village Swimming Pool Floor Replacement. This is on page 323 to 337 of the agenda packs. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Leader. Um, this report seeks Cabinet's endorsement of the plan that Sports and Leisure Management, or SLM as we call it, would like to progress for the would like to progress with the replacement of the movable swimming pool floor at Basildon Sporting Village, as the current one is beyond economical repair. The, pr rep <coughs> the proposal is for the replacement of the movable floor to be funded from the building's life cycle account that the council holds on behalf of the operator, SLM, to ensure that the facility remains in an excellent condition throughout the duration of the contract. And although the funds within the life cycle account belong to SLM, cabinet has to endorse, um, or cabinet endorsement is sought due to the significant expenditure that is required. Um, the works will commence in April 25, and this will enable the payment schedule to be divided over three years to further help reduce the risk of depleting the lifestyle, uh, the life cycle account. Um, I don't have a great deal else to say on this at the moment, other than the fact um, that the recommendation can be found on page 324. I think it's fairly boilerplate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. Um, I've just got a few questions. What is the primary function of the life cycle account and will utilising the funds from this account potentially put the building at risk if other priorities suddenly arise? How will the introduction of the new movable swimming pool affect the overall revenue, the sporting village? The report highlights that there's a missed opportunity for income generation from swimming galas. Can you provide more details on the potential financial gains the sporting village will experience once the pool is operational? And during the construction of the new pool, what arrangements will be made for current users of the sporting village, including children who regularly attend swimming lessons there? Sorry, Councillor, I'll try and pick up on them uh, one by one. The first question was in relation to... Yeah, sorry, thank you. So the life cycle account is um, SLM, it's part of the contract that SLM, um, or the, the winning provider of, of when that contract went out, um, pr um, put money into a life cycle account over the period of the contract for um, the council to hold and for them to draw down their money um, to ensure that the, the building remained in tip-top condition throughout the period of the contract. Okay, so the next question was, how will the introduction of the new movable swimming pool affect the revenue? 
um, and what are the potential financial gains that we'll get once the new pool is operational because there's mention of the fact that we've missed out on opportunities such as the swimming galas and other events yeah, so it's it's not count. It won't be for the council, but it will be for the contract it, it itself. So yes, um, to to get the uh, floor operational again, we'll see uh, an impact to um, for SLM's operating contract profits um, on the basis that for the works will take probably about sixteen weeks to to take place. Um, that's not ideal. It's a very difficult thing uh, to, to be done, um, but of course. Um, we've got a 50 meter remo uh, movable pool floor um, and for a reason, and if it's uh, if it's not operational, you know, it's, it, we need the building back to being exactly as it was designed. So, with regards to SLM, they have obviously um, accounted for that that loss of income that they that they will take over that period. But of course, they are operating two other pools within the borough. Um, so our, um, we'll be supporting people as much as they can to be able to access those pools within the borough. And, and obviously, uh, I've also got um, pools in, in neighbouring authorities as well, but we'll try to keep them within the borough. And there is also other pools within the borough, of course, as well, which we hope people will be able to use. Um, the swimming galas um, take place through the very, very successful uh, local uh, swimming club, um, Basin Phoenix. Um, and at the minute, um, they've not been able to, to, to do so. So that's having two impacts, really. It's, it's stopping the sport being able to, and the club being able to drive forward with um, uh, a significantly um, fantastic swimming club, and winning national awards, I must say. We should be very proud of them. Um, and also um, means that SLM are not being able to recover that, uh, the profits that they would need. We have a profit share agreement with, 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 with SLM and the fact that um, the galas are not being taken place is, is meaning that we're not reaching the level where we are seeing uh, profits coming back into the council at this stage. So we are hopeful that this will get us closer to that also. Um, just on the swimming lessons for children that are currently taking place in the sporting village, what will happen with them? Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, it is difficult. We talk, the, the team will be talking to the the the, the, um, the families and the children themselves. The aim is to get as many of those over to the other other pools as, as they can. Um, I'm I'm not going to sit here and say that it won't see some short term pain for some, but we're trying to we will work with them and be pushing them hard to mitigate that as much as possible. <coughs> Ultimately, getting the pool back functioning and operational is going to see a significant uplift and opportunity for families ongoing. Um, so it is regrettable that we're in a situation where we need to fix this, but we will do our utmost to make sure that the impact is, is, is lessened as much as possible. I mean, thank goodness we got the Eversley pool built as we promised the electorate that we would do so, because that actually acts as a ability to act as a bit of a buffer. And uh, I want to thank you, County Coo, for taking such a keen interest in the sporting village especially considering you were running to the media only a few months ago with wild fantasies about it going bust and creating consternation among yeah. staff and the public and communities uh, as something that wasn't viable and wasn't going to be here. So yeah. now, hopefully, with, the, with even more facts at hand, you'll be an advocate and a supporter of the Sporting Village. Yeah. I haven't seen, oh, Councillor Rimmer. Uh, no, thank you, Leader. Um, to be honest, I mean, this is... Um, something that we've been aware of as you know needed to be done for some time um, I've had residents of other boroughs who knew me personally contact me because their own children were doing swimming meets or swimming races there and then suddenly they couldn't and they were asking me when is this going to be operational again and have the full use of the full pool so um, ultimately once this is done we are going to have you know, uh, three of these pools across the bar run by SLM as top class facilities. I mean, that's a result, isn't it? Um, so I think, yes, it, I think Councillor Yacoub asked really good questions and obviously kicking the tyres on this um, is important. But ultimately, um, the outcome for 16 weeks of pain is, is going to be worth it in terms of the facilities that we're going to have. Thank you, Councillor Rimmer. Councillor Schrader. Thank you, Leader. Um, I did just want to ask, um, I mean, kind of similar to uh, uh, Councillor Rimmer, 
Um, I, uh, Mr. Taylor will be aware I've, I've had constituents who've contacted me um, uh, with a certain degree of consternation in the past where the, the facility has been unavailable because the, the movable floor has been broken. Well, I just would like to know what, what would be the normal um, kind of life cycle of a piece of kit like this? What would we normally, how long would we normally expect to last? So I, I mean, I assume it went in in 2011 when the, <coughs> when the BSV opened. Um, and obviously I'm aware that uh, it's the largest in the country um, and it's sort of part of the, the Olympic legacy of the BSV. Um, and I do note on page 325, does say 95% of new builds in the country come with very pool floors, and research suggests that these floors have not experienced any regular ongoing issues. But I'm aware that we have had ongoing uh, issues with the floor. Um, is there... What, what, would we not be better off, I guess is the question I want to ask, would we not be better off just having a normal pool that doesn't have a movable floor with all the attendant problems that come with that and it's, it is noted in the report that because it's a specialist item there are there is this limited supply chain so when it breaks it tends to be broken for ages um what sell, sell me on the benefits of <laughs> having a movable floor as opposed to a, a a straightforward swimming pool that doesn't articulate in that way i suppose the answer to that is <clears throat> to do that we're gonna have to pour quite a large amount of concrete into the pool um, and then tile it, which will be substantially more than 16, 16 weeks of work, which um, that was the original plan that we do away with it. And would it be any cheaper? No, it wouldn't. Um, so um, that puts that to bed and cuts out the ability to have a gala because you'd have uh, a depth of 1.1 metre or 1.3 metre at the shallow end and then 1.8 at the end, which means they wouldn't be able to dive at both ends. So um, that's the restriction. In terms of the floor... 2011 was a long time ago in terms of equipment development. The pool floor was a problem from the beginning and lots of adaptations have been made to it in the last few years. It's at a point where they're frightened to move it now and it will become dangerous. So it was technology that worked whenever you hear the line, the largest movable pool floor in Europe. It, most people go, that's good, isn't it? I was a bit... <laughs> couldn't have someone tested it before we got one so but um so but it has lasted it has been used um but the variable one from the ones that the team have been to see and from what we know from an operator that's got a number of them they're nowhere near as much of a problem and if there is any issues the call out is very quick to them to be able to do it and that will bring some trust back i think because there's been lots of problems as i will know lots of members have been contacted of when the pool stops as have my team, um, it is a bit of an inconvenience when you've got a gala on with thousands of people turning up and the pool floor won't work. So this then puts a lot of trust back in the facility and we'll draw that income back in and put the centre back where it was on the day we opened. Senator Henry, would you like to wind up? Thank you, Leader. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we've got a, a facility in this borough that actually we managed to get more out of. It's got so many different things going on all the time. Um, there's so many different organisations using it, so much excitement around its use. Um, I think we, we, you know, we have a fantastic working relationship with SLM. They're a really, really, really good, a really good partner. They're, they're um, fantastic support to the community, and they're not confined to just the four walls of. of the sporting village. Um, I think that this is a, a really sensible, sensible approach, um, and I'm glad we had the foresight to make such a policy possible that we do have some sort of a tap to draw down from. Because obviously, we know what it's like to try and keep um, all of our assets across the borough maintained in the way that we do. So that's it from me, leader. Um, the recommendation is on page three two four. Thank you, Councillor Henry. All those in favour? <coughs> Thank you, members. That is carried. We now move on to item 13, the licence of land in Woodland Road for use as a market. This is on page 339 to 347 of your agenda, and this is Councillor Rimmer. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, <coughs> actually, Councillor Sargent was speaking earlier, obviously, about the role of local councils. And this is another interesting development in that um, evolution of local councils in the sense that here with this licence, what we're actually proposing is for Wickford Town Council to take over the running and the management of the market and actually see if they can create another revenue stream for themselves from that as well and make it, and in a very bottom-up way actually, uh, manage the market in a way that meets the needs of the local residents. Um, one of my officers and, and Paul um, they, and did a great amount of work on this. Um, Caroline and Paul did a great amount of work on this in terms of moving the market site um, when unfortunately we weren't able to continue it in the high street um, due to um, the public consultation process. Uh, we still have ambitions at some point to put it back into Wickford High Street um, and we won't lose sight of that ambition. But what we have been able to make is on the Woodland Road um, a, a site that is suitable <coughs> for a market and has been thriving as a market there, just slightly uh, different scale, it's fair to say. And, but I think with this, with that local impetus from the town council, and with the accountability that comes with that, with being closer to residents, I think we could see um, quite a change there <coughs> and a thriving Wickford market. So I commend this report um, to the Cabinet. Thank you, Councillor Rummer. Councillor Yacoub. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose I've just got one question. Just from a best value point of view, the recommendation three of... <coughs> giving uh, Wickford Council a period of six months rent free for the kiosk. Is that something that we feel is good value? Are we losing money as a result? Is it, is it best value? Um, the unit is currently empty and our hope is that by regenerating the market and getting some more footfall up there it will draw actually a, uh, a post potential tenant for that unit. So at the moment it lies empty and we have nobody waiting on the list. So. We're hoping to this will use it as a marketing ploy to get people to. to well, I'm a great believer in seed funding. Uh, Councillor Rummer. <coughs> yes, and one of the Wickford councillors has already come forward with, with an idea, and they, I think they've posited it with the town council, which is, I think, one of the I think it's one of the food units in the market. They find that sometimes that their goods could be perishing if they're putting them out, and actually, if they use the kiosk instead, um, they would be able to keep produce fresh and be able to sell it. So that could be one opportunity, but obviously um, it's, it will be with the town councils to see if they wish to take that up. Yes, and I have heard that there's a, maybe a resident that's interested in selling shoes from it, I believe, as well. Uh, yes, I understand that. Right, did you want to wind up, Kazarilla? No, I, I, think, um, I think that's... Um, been very useful and thank you for your question leader in terms of the value for money aspect and opening it up in terms of the use of the kiosk um, I just would ask everybody to vote for the recommendations as set out on page 340 thank you thank you those in favor thank you members we have that carried so we now move to <coughs> item 15 uh, which is uh, members IT provision of equipment this is on page 951 to 965 of the agenda. Um, this is Mr. Young in conjunction with myself. Uh, I would point out that the nub of this report and that the heart of it is the cyber security and the very real threat that <coughs> councils are facing from cyber attack and potential uh, malfeasance from people that are criminally orientated. We have seen the NHS who have had a huge cost of, I think the, I have a, a client of mine who worked the NHS on the, the time that they got hacked and uh, his conservative estimation was it was a cost of one and a half million a day that it actually cost them with regards to the, um, the impact of that, whether that is an accurate assessment or not, I don't know. But we have seen 
time and time again reports of cyber attacks on different organisations and different institutions, and we are obligated to ensure that we protect the council, because by protecting the council, we are by definition protecting residents, because God forbid uh, we did have a cyber attack against the council, which cost us a huge amount of money, that actually translates to a lack of services, going into special measures, potential 114 notices, etc., etc., etc. I want to thank officers because what they've done is recognise that in order to deal with this cyber security issue, that not one size is necessarily going to fit all. We have different members from, with different <coughs> ways of working and everything else, and the end result will be sitting down with members to find members the appropriate solution with the appropriate equipment in order to actually be safe from a, from a uh, cyber point of view. But what it's not, and I know there will be some commentary from different sources that says it is, this is not some sort of freebie to councillors to give them free laptops or, or free equipment. This is a functionality, a requirement that in order to do the job, to do it efficiently and to protect the organisation, we're putting the appropriate steps into place. And in fact, given the changes to the IT allowance and given the fact that this will go to the Independent Remuneration Committee, it is anticipated that there will be uh, no additional cost, I understand, uh, for the provision of the equipment. But I don't know if Mr Young wanted to expand on anything I may have missed on that before we go to members. Thank you, Leader. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think you, you've covered it comprehensively, uh, Leader, in, in terms of your introduction. The only points I'd add, <clears throat> just for the purposes of clarity, um, there is no recommendation in this report that members are gifted or given any equipment. This is, a, this is a, a set of recommendations that would require members to use council equipment, much in the same way that I am using the microphone on this desk at the moment. It isn't my property, but I am required to use it to fulfil my duties. The machinery would remain in the ownership of the council at all times. The recommendations in the report uh, to onward refer to remuneration panel are an attempt to mitigate any cost to the public uh, purse of the requirement to use that equipment. So there are two elements to the report there. And, uh, Leader, you have um, more eloquently than I uh, explained the, the reason that we're bringing the report tonight, which is the cyber security based re reason. One of the duties that I fulfil for the Council is Senior Information Risk Officer, sometimes known as CSIRO, and we have identified as part of that role that cyber security represents the single highest continuing risk to this council of any of the risks that we monitor. So uh, the report is brought before members in that context. Thank you very much, Leader. Thank you, Mr Young. Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. As a member of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, where we have extensively discussed these matters now, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the significant threat posed by the cyber attacks to the council. Um, but I am pretty sure Councillor Rimmer's handouts to View Cinema will drive us to bankruptcy before a cyber attack ever does. Sorry, Councillor Yacoub, I, I cut you off. She'd strayed off the agenda again uh, because I, I didn't see anything in this report that mentioned View Cinema. Sure, Councillor Bagger, I, I'll stick to the agenda. I also want to express that we have had workshops that have been put on which um, have been quite useful. Um, it's worth noting that over a year ago, as, as it has been mentioned here already, that there was a lot of opposition towards this for various reasons, um, including the cost, but also the fact that it was quite impractical to carry around um, multiple laptops. So I think the inclusion of a tablet or a phone option um, in this recommendation is a positive step. Um, and I think that concerns around um, the cost, um, you know, they are alleviated given that we are now repurposing the current a member IT allowance to cover the scheme's cost. Um, there are still questions around other applications that members can use, and I think it's really important that members are able to do their job as councillors. Um, so whether they're using a tablet or a phone, you know, I think a phone will restrict them a lot because they won't have access to, for example, Microsoft um, applications, but whether it's a tablet or a laptop, there are other applications um, that members will probably need permission um, to be able to use. So I think conversations around that need to continue to take place. Um, but overall, I think, you know, <coughs> this is something that we do need to do. Thank you, uh, Councillor Yacoub. Uh, Councillor Schrader. 
Um, thank you, Leader. God help me, I, I agree with Councillor Yacoub. That's a, a strange and unusual feeling. Um, I, I think this is something we've all known for some time uh, needs to be considered. We, um, we know that the risk of cyber attacks uh, are one of the greatest open-ended threats to the Council. Um, and we know pretty confidently that um, the, the single most obvious point of vulnerability for the Council <coughs> is members, it's us. Um, at present, um, uh, Basildon councillors aren't supplied with any, um, any actual kit. Um, we all make our own arrangements. Uh, some of us have PCs, some of us have laptops or tablet devices. Uh, some do all their council work on their own personal iPhones. Um, some, for all I know, maybe uh, going down to the library and using the computers there. We've got, we've got no idea, really. Um, and <coughs> I think that the, the risks inherent in these lax arrangements uh, are probably obvious. Um, now, our reluctance, inevitably, stems from a, a fear councillors always tend to have around this sort of thing, um, of being seen to be, you know, splashing out on fancy laptops for ourselves. Um, uh, and I, I dare say that, that some of that criticism will, will, will come to bear on, on, on any decision we make this evening. But I think that uh, the issue is coming to a head now. We're, as I understand it, and Mr Young will correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're under fairly sustained regular uh, cyber attacks as it is. Um, members will be aware that, that I work for a, a local authority in London. Um, it's exactly the same there as well. I have to say um, all officers and members there are supplied with IT that's been you know, signed off by, by the council. Um, and it is the same, uh, obviously, with Essex County Council. We know that county members are supplied <coughs> with, with the, the equipment that they need uh, to do that job. So I, I, I think that the seriousness of, of this can hardly be understated. We know that some councils um, uh, you know, have hit, been hit to the tune of hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, and it, it, it's not inconceivable that a cyber attack could quite literally wipe this council out. So members need to be cognizant of the, the seriousness of that threat and also the security of our residents' data, particularly given that we are all data handlers. Um, many of us are, 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 are often presented with fairly sensitive personal information by our constituents during the, uh, the course of undertaking our casework. <coughs> so, in all honesty, Leader, while, while I have no particular uh, desire to be lumbered with another piece of kit, I'm not a great lover of, of technology anyway, um, I think the ongoing risk to the council of not doing so probably uh, outweighs any squeamishness I have about the, uh, you know, any upfront costs uh, or, or my own reluctance to be um, uh, furnished with yet another piece of tech. Um, so I think that any reservations I may have have to be countered by the fact that I think this is just too important for us to, to, to put off any further. Um, we did have a report on this about a year ago. Um, it was, as Councillor Yacoub said, it, it went to scrutiny. It, it was given a fairly good kick about by members who <coughs> raised uh, some fairly understandable concerns. And I think that the policy that's come back before us is very much improved. But it is still nonetheless as urgent now as it was then. And I think we need to proceed on that basis. Thank you, Leader. No, I think you've submitted that very well, Councillor Schrader and Tony Councillor Yacoub, to be fair. I think that the key thing is we need to make sure we have a workable solution that members are comfortable with, but never forgetting that the driving force is the cyber security issues first, and therefore they, they take precedence, um, but not without actually having a level of flexibility in, in the fact that members will work differently in, in different ways. Uh, Councillor Henry. Thank you. Leader, um, I think 
most people in conversation are just going, no, nope, I don't want another beer king. I don't want this, I don't want that. I think for me personally, um, Councillor Schrader has covered a, a good bit of that. But what I would say is that since the, the creation of ICBs or ICS, um, I'm having more health conversations as a borough councillor than, I, than ever before. Um, I'm getting quite a variety of, of inquiries come through. With information, it worries me that I get it on my mobile phone. I've gone through all of the, the, the normal narratives with IT here, so I've got a two-point um, access um, aspect on my phone, so I know the information's safe, but I think it could be safer, and I'd, I'd very much... I don't particularly want another bit of kit. I've already got one, one bit for Essex, and it's a pain lugging it about. And when you forget it, you can't. You feel like you've gone blind. But it's essential. It's absolutely essential. I've learned um, in the last couple of years as, as a cabinet member, I've learned to work with my team, and we, we use teams for everything. If I need an officer, I can go on and see if they're in a meeting, or see if they're out of the business, or see if they're on holiday. <coughs> or I can see if they're, they're green, in which case then now would be a good time to call them because they're showing us free. I can go on, they share very, very large files that aren't sent to me, that aren't taking a, a century to download or aren't crashing my phone because they're stored on a cloud base somewhere where this is um, safe and easily accessible and I don't need to walk around with 15 stone agenda papers either, which I hope would be another output of, of this, that we become, or work towards becoming a paperless council, because it is preposterous that we have somebody coming round to 11 houses with a thousand pages for each one, and that's without then whatever spare copies our offices might print should somebody else appear. Um, or whether we've got guest speakers. So it's, it's preposterous that we do all the work that we're doing on biodiversity and the environment, and then we're sending around 15 trees, um, you know, for every meeting that we have. So I'm absolutely in favour of this. I don't particularly want the kit, I really don't, but I do want a solution that, that I can at least go to bed at night knowing that I'm keeping my residents that contact me safe. So I think it's, a, it's, it's not a question, really. It's just to get on with it. Thank you. Councillor Henry, I must be a bit of an eco-terrorist because I quite like paper, but uh, talking earlier, I know Councillor Rimmer uh, came up with a brilliant idea with regard to how we could save paper and also achieve, uh, you know, agendas, and so I think that uh, hopefully that will be carried through as we, as we progress, but Councillor Rimmer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Peter. Um, no, I, I just felt that the idea was to actually not have so many enclosures and have links off to enclosures because I think as one can see the local plan aspect has probably taken about five to six hundred pages of this report because of the level of enclosures involved which is is natural but we they could have been linked off in, in respect of this um, I must admit I and, and I've shared this skepticism uh, I I actually am in the camp of cloud security as a whole as you know and less on the having too much hardware camp and part of it is an eco reason on that as well because obviously um, we're going to get to the point where you could be renewing laptops and devices every four to eight years depending on how long <laughs> they last obviously there's rare earth materials that actually get used in this hardware so there's an element of mining and how much natural resource in terms of our natural capital is actually um, destroyed as a result um, whilst you know if you're going down the cloud security route in the future that's not a problem um, potentially now I am obviously we need to come to a solution quickly because the threat is really there and we've got to do one that actually works with um, our council resources and budget so I am convinced that this is the right way for now to, to actually plug any holes in the dam to make sure that it's not breaking open. But I would like officers to think about cloud security for the future because I wouldn't want us to be in a situation where we're perpetually renewing devices. So I just want to consider. Um, I also wonder if there is actually going to be an aspect of cloud security with these devices because um, 
<coughs> in respect, if one is given a laptop, so this is a question, by the way, sorry. If, if one's given a laptop, are you going to actually have to enter into, um, into the cloud or into some form of security post that um, to separate whatever you might be doing personally on that in terms of work? So if, let's say, for instance, um, we're writing up a motion for council, and we'd rather it wasn't out there on the, on, you know, in the shared cloud for whatever reason, um, but we'd like to keep it secret until it's published. <laughs> You know, can we, you know, at least have the acknowledgement that there would be an ability to work offline without that being shared um, or, or to work in a, you know, outside of the cloud, outside of the council security, not outside of the council security, outside of the council's shared universe. Um, so that, that's my question. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rimmer. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to provide some assurance, uh, the cybersecurity approach that's being proposed to members is, is inclusive of cloud security as well as device level security, as well as perimeter security firewalls, as well as system level security in terms of the applications that are provided. Uh, going back to Councillor Yacoub's point from earlier about application tailoring. Um, so. We are proposing that all of those levels of security are present in terms of this council's defence of the sensitive data that a number of councillors tonight have spoken about. We don't see them as mutually exclusive levels of security. We see them as inclusive and they are all contained within the current cyber security approach that this council takes towards how officers operate that we are proposing to extend by the use of devices to members. So that's the first point. Second point I would raise is um, uh, we are proposing uh, in this report to tailor the implementation of this so that we hold one-to-one -one conversations with councillors and therefore we would be able to pick up both the app point that was raised earlier and any particular requirements that councillors have. For example, the one that you just outlined there, Councillor Rimmer, in terms of preparation of private material before you wanted to share it. And thirdly, please be assured that these devices come with private space which also sits within that cloud secure environment and benefits from a level of device security. So you can have your cake and eat it in terms of data protection uh, before you are ready to share something in a public cloud environment. Um, the, reason that that's, the reason that that's important, and, and, and um, leader for the purposes of clarity, um, I'm not professing to being a uh, technical cybersecurity expert here, nor am I professing to go into any more detail for obvious business continuity per reasons about our cybersecurity arrangements in, in a part one conversation. Um, but, um, but the reason I, I raise all of that is because the report the report is recommending is a whole package of uh, measures which go towards the protection of resident data for members. Thank you. Mr. Young, Kazarima. No, thank you. I mean, and that was quite helpful. Um, but I just wanted to know also, <coughs> you, you talked about private space for members. I guess, where does that, and you may not know the answer, maybe Paula knows the answer, where does that actually stand in law if there's a freedom of information request? Is it still private in that respect then, or is the council obliged to open up? our members' private folder. I think the, the usual provisions would apply, Councillor. The same provisions would apply for the use of that resource. Sorry, if you're holding information for, if you're doing council business on any device, it's subject to freedom of information, whether it's a personal device or a council device. That, that is the case now. Um, regardless of which device you're using. So that is the case now with the devices that you've got in front of you this evening. This is becoming a very elongated conversation and straying from the actual topic, but go on, Kazarima. Uh, just, I, I appreciate that, absolutely, but just in terms of the request, would that have to come through the councillor? 
to request to say this request has come, or would the council just act? Um, and, and that's and it's just it's a matter for me. It's just a matter of understanding the level of privacy or not that particular folder would have. Um, so the current process that the council operates for FOIs would would always include reaching out to the owner of that data as part of the um, FOI request or, or any other associated information request. So that, that practice, we're not proposing to change that practice by the provision of uh, hardware, by the provision of physical equipment. But that is a, that is a process which exists now uh, in the council uh, and would include reaching out to, in this example that you're giving, yourself. Thank you. Mr Sparks. Very good, quickly, if I can. I think it's worth noting, obviously, this, this topic was discussed at audit and risk as well. Just to emphasise the point, this is really one of the biggest risks we've got at Council, so this conversation is, 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 really, is really helpful. Also, to flag up, in the media this week, there's been another Council that's been hacked just this week. And their system's been down for a couple of weeks and trying to move back online. Just emphasise this is a real problem. It's happening to real Councils now. So just really emphasising the, the, the seriousness and why it's really good to have this conversation. Thank you, Mr Sparks. Councillor Schreiber. Uh, very, very briefly, it, it's, it's quite tangential, but I just wanted to touch on the, the, the comment that, that Jeff, uh, Councillor Henry, uh, made about um, printing, because I think, mm. uh, I, I don't know that it would make a huge amount of difference. Uh, I think a lot of us have a device that we could read our agendas on if we really wanted to, and we probably should, but I, I do think if we all had a laptop or, or a council laptop or a device of some kind that we were encouraged to read them on, I mean, fortunately, they're not all as ridiculous as this. But I do think, actually, at a time when we're looking at the cost of the council, the cost of paper and printing has gone up immensely. This will have cost a fortune. Um, and as Councillor Rimmer says, there are parts of it that probably could have been, you know, uh, we could have accessed electronically and didn't need to be in the printed agenda. But I'm just going to mention that the chap who delivers them all to us, I did actually speak to him because, of course, he couldn't get it through my door. Um, so he had to knock. Um, and I happened to mention to him that the mayor had passed away. And he, he asked, oh, uh, you know, where did, he, where did he live? And I told him. And he remembered delivering stuff to him. He said, oh, I stopped delivering to him a few years ago because he arranged that he, he didn't want any paper agendas anymore. He, all of his were sent electronically. And I remember thinking ahead of this, this debate, yes, of course. I mean, Luke would have thought this was utterly preposterous. He read all his agendas online, and I've reached the conclusion he was absolutely right. So I'm going to send a similar instruction myself. I prefer paper. I do. And I have a whole ritualised thing I do with my agendas. But I, I think it's a cost this council doesn't require. So I think we should all, all take a leaf from Luke's book. Thank you. Oh, well, you'll be espousing veganism next. Um, right. The... Recommendation is on page 952 of the report. All those in favour? Thank you, members. We now move on to item 16, the extension of the housing management IT system contract. Uh, again, this is myself in conjunction with Mr Young. Oh, no. It's, is it Mr Young? Is he you? Okay. Um, again, we, uh, if you look at the boards outside, which show the history of Basden Council, Basden Council has been going for a long, long time. And in the same way that we have huge problems in the infrastructure of the council uh, across the borough with regards to patchwork ownership of land, legacy land, etc., 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 we also have the same within our IT systems because the council has been going for a long time. Systems have been have come in, then other systems have come in to support them. Licenses have changed. The world has changed and we've had to actually start to update our entire management system. Um, the extension of this contract, I understand, is, is a victim of part of that, because, if I'm correct, and I'm sure officers will correct me if I'm wrong, when we've actually put it out to tender, we couldn't get anybody else to actually um, bid for this particular system, which has actually necessitated keeping the current system we have, or we actually go out and, and find a more suitable system. But, Mr Young, I'm sure you can be more eloquent than I have on this particular item, as myself and IT are not good friends. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, so I think you covered most of the points. The, um, the, ho the housing management system is, is planned for re uh, replacement as part of the IT strategy that members uh, agreed in 2020. Um, so this is a planned piece of work. We went to procurement in good time. 
we engage with the market. We are now on the second round of procurement engagement, having uh, clarified our spec and been able to attract a number of potential suppliers to the table. The, the delay between round one and round two of our procurements means that it makes uh, business continuity sense to seek an extension to our current provider so that there is no gap in provision between procuring a new system, uh, implementing that system, and the ending of the contract for the current system. Uh, members have got two options this evening, which is an extension of one year or an extension of two years. Uh, given that there is a favourable rate that is provided for a two-year extension, and given that the significance and size and complexity of the system that we are replacing, uh, officers are recommending a two-year extension to give us ample uh, continu uh, continuity and um, uh, sufficient uh, space uh, for the project to deliver uh, on time, uh, Chair. Thank you, Mr Young. And I do know that Councillor Headley, the uh, champion and cabinet member for procurement, has also been looking at this, and he uh, was very, very clear that he would support that worry to be here. Councillor Yacoub. Thank you. I understand that the contract ends in July of this year. Um, why has this extension been left to the last minute? Uh, thanks, Councillor Cooper. As I was explaining, um, we originally were not intending to extend, or we thought that we would have a very short extension such that the, the, the cost of that would fall below a, a Cabinet decision. Uh, but that was based on our first procurement round uh, with a, um, you know, a favourable wind in terms of making progress with that. Given that the market uh, re responded to us um, with, without coming forward with uh, potential suppliers, we then had to go through a, a second round of procu procurement, re-specify what it was that we were seeking and encourage the market to reply to us. We uh, have had success with that uh, and we are in conversation with a number of suppliers now. The gap between those two rounds of procurement has eaten into the contingency period that we had in this project. So whilst we still remain confident that we would reach a position of a preferred supplier by the end of the current contract date, we have eaten into the implementation period for the new system. And given that housing uh, represents uh, such a significant aspect of this council's provision to residents, and given that the element of the housing management system under replacement is connected with rent and rental income and collection, uh, it's deemed too significant a risk to allow uh, a, a shortened implementation period. And that's the reason that we've brought the report to you now. Uh, just, just to follow up on that, I understand that there have been at least 12 contracts between uh, September 2022 um, and August 2023, where instead of going towards a full procurement process, we have chosen instead to extend the contract. Um, and a lot of the times this has happened on a last minute basis. Um, this seems to be a pattern of this administration. Um, what lessons have we learned from this and how can we do things differently? The council, um, the council looks at each procurement for each service on, on the merits of that particular service need. We uh, carry out a comprehensive uh, project plan uh, uh, activity so that we are clear about the length of time that changing a system will take uh, and we allow a contingency as part of that project. In addition, the council has carried out a review of its procurement activities which is reported at each meeting of overview and scrutiny commission and has introduced a procurement pipeline so that members have a transparent oversight of all of the procurements and contract end dates that are coming forward just to clarify on that uh, i know the county coob is a political animal and would like to make it sort of somehow the administration's fault and a political issue but in fact it is actually more symptomatic of the procurement process and some of the elongated and convoluted hoops that councils have to jump through in order to procure, coupled with the fact that there is out there in the big real world a reticence for a number of contractors now to actually put bids in for certain items and where we are struggling in a lot of areas to find people that actually wish to bid or actually offer um, their, their, their bids to councils. Councillor uh, thank you, Leader. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, 
and I would just uh, sound a note of caution if we're going to go down the route of saying that administrations are to be judged on <coughs> the effectiveness of how they handle procurement contracts <laughs> because anyone who aspires to lead a council in the near future um, may not wish to set that precedent because local government procurement is complete miasma. It's incredibly complicated. I think the fact that um, we didn't get any bids on the first round of procurement probably underscores that point. It's a very, very challenging marketplace for local authorities now to procure on a host of contracts because, um, frankly, we're not as attractive as we once were. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, in terms of our business here tonight, um, in the interests of business continuity, and as Mr Young has said, this, this particular um, uh, system could hardly be uh, more crucial to uh, the, the council. Um, I think that going for the two years is probably the wisest course under the circumstances. Um, I think Councillor Yacoub is perfectly, uh, it's perfectly reasonable to raise the fact that we have had a lot of uh, things come before us um, uh, that have been a bit lastminute.com. Um, apart from anything else, we've raised that issue ourselves. You have uh, uh, in particular, Leader. Um, and as a consequence of um, you know, a certain amount of dissatisfaction around that, we now have um, the procurement pipeline. We have that greater level of accountability through the Overview and Scrutiny Commission. And um, we have the first ever, as far as I can remember, dedicated cabinet member who has procurement oversight within his portfolio. And Councillor Headley is going through a lot of these, um, the, the, these, these procurement exercises with a fine-tooth comb. Now, but there's only so much he can do as one individual. It is, it is up to all of us as members to pick up some of that slack and start kicking the tyres on these things more than perhaps we have in the past. And certainly the experience of um, some neighbouring authorities ought to give us all pause for thought, and, uh, and I think every, every elected member should be taking a much closer interest in procurement than we have perhaps in the past. I think that it behooves us to, uh, to, to kick the tyres on these things more than we have. And um, I think all the, um, uh, all the, all this administration has certainly put in place all the mechanisms to enable uh, elected members to do that, and obviously through the, through the Cabinet member we have that additional level of um, oversight. Thank you, Leader. No, thank you, Councillor Schrader. Um, we are going to move to the recommendation, which is on page 967. <coughs> All those in favour? Thank you. I'm now going to uh, meander and possibly take um, just officer advice on protocols here. Uh, but by way of explanation, uh, as an administration, we believe in being as transparent as it is possible to be. But we also recognise the sanctity and rationale behind having part two items. Uh, the rationale behind having part two items is because a lot of the time they can either be individually, personally or corporately sensitive. They can have um, commercial implications for the, the people that we are uh, dealing with or negotiating with. Uh, there can be contracts where uh, it is sensitive information that competitors of the people that are bidding might not want to make known. There are all sorts of very valid reasons why officers, and it's an officer decision as to whether something is part two, is made to a part two item or not. A part two item is never made, uh, a decision is never made by the administration to put something in part two. It is on the advice of our professional officers. So, in the previous iteration of the Cabinet agenda, the Pitsy Community Diagnostic Centre was going to be a part two item. But having looked at it, there is only one page of the report that effectively is part two. Uh, and therefore, we are moving it into part one uh, in order to be able to have the debate. However, if any member strays into that particular page, we will immediately shift to part two. Because of that, the normal and the, the legal process is to consider excluding the public and press from a meeting during consideration of a following item of business on the grounds it's likely if any member of the public and press were present during consideration of the items, there would be a disclosure of an item of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A to Local Government Act 1972 and the public interest in maintaining this exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. All the items after the Pitsy Diagnostic Centre are part two items. 
So I'm going to ask now for members to consider excluding the public and press, who aren't here anyway, so that if we do stray into it, we can then move straight into part two and continue part two, rather than having to halt, have the vote and everything else. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Leader. As this is... No, you're not. No, we, we have to do a vote first. I'm asking for a vote. I'm moving... Vote on whether to move to part two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If, if he strays into it. No. Yes. If so, we are now going to vote on moving into part two if it strays into it, and that will carry over then to all the items subsequent on the agenda. All those in favour of excluding the non-existent public and press? Thank you very much. That means we can now discuss this item in transparency, but if it does stray over, we will turn off the webcast... We will have the discussion appertaining to that item and the remaining items will remain in part two. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Leader. <clears throat> okay, the CDC programme is a national initiative uh, with 2.3 billion of capital funding allocated to create community diagnostic centres. This is designed to improve health outcomes and reduce health inequalities. This report provides a programme a progress update on the delivery of the Pitsy CDC project and requests an increase in the previously agreed capital contribution needed from 2.6 million to 3.4 million for the replacement facilities. It also seeks approval for the delegation of any necessary changes to the leasing structure which might be necessary to deliver the development to the Director of Resources in consultation with the Head of Property. Our report was presented to Cabinet on the 22nd of June 2023, where it was unanimously approved that to develop a, a CDC in partnership with the Mid and South Essex NHS Foundation Trust and Essex County Council, together with the new facilities for both councils. The project was also considered at People's Scrutiny on the 9th of November 2023. Approval was granted at the Planning Committee on the 7th of February in um, minute item number 4-2024 um, for the demolition of the existing buildings, the place and the ECC library and the redevelopment and the redevelopment of a site to provide a community diagnostic centre containing a new activity centre and library spaces. Since the last Cabinet, the Trust have been able to undertake further design work and there have been a number of meetings between the Trust design team and both Basildon Borough Council and Essex County Council officers. The detailed internal design for all occupiers has progressed with the layout for Basildon Council operated space now agreed in principle. As a result of the changes, the amount of space required by the Council has increased by around 10% and therefore estimated costs have also risen. Additionally, building costs have been rising at 7 to 8% per annum, leading to a slight uplift to costs. The additional 7.5 development agreement contingency on council space has also been applied. As such, it is now recommended that Basildon Borough Council capital contribution be increased to 3.4 million. This will be a capped amount, removing the risk of further build cost increases to the Council. And whilst the programme of works has not yet been finalised, draft timescales are provided within the report, and a draft timeline is the current estimate and may change as matters progress, in particular during the design works. However, the subject, um, subject to Trust Executive Board approval um, proposed start date of the site is expected to be from the summer of 2024. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kesla Henry. Uh, Kesla Yaku. Yes, yeah, so on my electronic agenda, the diagnostic centre is before the exclusion of public and press. Um, yes, it is. Yes. I did say that. Yes, yeah, so, so yeah. obviously I, the enclosure number three is in part two. It's only the enclosure. Right, okay. So is, it, is this... Can I make reference to this? No. 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 Okay. All right. Do you want to check with Owen first? Yeah.
Councillor Yacoub. Um, so, so, in order for me to, to share my comments, we will need to go into part two. Okay, then we will move into, we will, we'll start and then we'll come to you, you afterwards. Yeah. 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 Because I think that from my point of view, if ever there was a reason why a community diagnostic centre is needed, it was evidenced with the tragedy that we, we felt upon ourselves last week. At a time where we've been recognised that there are health inequalities across the borough, and with the NHS getting more and more uh, fine-tuned with its ability to diagnose illnesses and early diagnosis of a lot of the scourges that actually affect us, uh, the ability to have a, a building where people can go, get tested as early as possible, and to therefore then get the right, the, right, the right and the appropriate treatments that can make a difference between whether they are alive or not is absolutely paramount in my mind. And both this and the St Galliards uh, project, which is coming to fruition, I actually think will have such a massive positive impact for the residents of this borough on health outcomes alone that it is absolutely to be applauded and to be done, but done with the right level of due diligence, the right level of probity, and the right level of ensuring that we're not actually uh, running before we can walk in ensuring that all of these things are done and the right processes were into place. So I absolutely uh, applaud the report. I applaud the officers on the work they've done so far. Um, and I will now hand over to Councillor Rummer. Uh, thank you, Leader. I'd echo those words. Um, I, th I think it is key to get early diagnosis, and in essentially this is what this is offering. Um, I've understood from colleagues in Clacton where they have a similar facility, but they're going straight from the GP into one of these clinical diagnosis centres the same day, if not next day, on occasions. And we are talking about the cutting down the time to diagnosis, uh, you know, with this um, new, TC, new CT scanning will cut waiting lists by 85% with 20,748 more tests per year. That's there in the report. There's going to be increased MRI capacity, cutting waiting lists in half. Um, and we're going to have ultrasound, phlebotomy, endoscopy, DEXA bone density scans, x-rays taking place in the new CDC. So it's going to be a source of local employment. Um, there's going to be 100 new roles. And at least 25% of those are committed to go to local residents. So this is um, a great thing as well. Um, also, we're future-proofing our library and we're future-proofing our activity centre um, and making it possibly more disabled access as a result as well. So these are all great things. So if, as well as improving people's health outcomes physically, um, and, and we are also looking at tackling loneliness and having participation in society and community. Um, when you look at Okinawa in Japan, people there are living to about 100, and they're actually having healthy lives, you know, um, teaching karate on the beach, um, arm wrestling 30-year-olds and winning at it. Um, this is maybe, you know, maybe we're dreaming a bit, but in, in essence, it's good to have these aspirations because in Japan, healthy life expectancy is much higher. And also it's that last year, they have usually on average one year of unhealthy. Whilst in the UK, um, there's, an, there's an average of a lot higher than that, sort of three to five years of unhealthy life. And, and the idea is to have longer, healthier lives for our residents um, in the borough. And, of course, this is going to help the whole of South Essex as well. Um, and this is key. Um, the leader rightly mentioned Galliard Homes as well as the health of, uh, facility that's coming into the East Gate. But there's also the new ambulance hub that will be coming as well, which will actually increase, hopefully, response time. We will actually reduce response times by ambulances as well and probably... You know, those extra minutes will actually help in terms of saving people's lives as well. So all of this together, I think, is, is going to be great for, for Pitsy, for the borough, for South Essex. 
and um, I, I just I'm so proud of what we as an administration and what our government has actually been doing in this respect is actually delivering. In Pitsy, there's a new swimming pool, there's a new CDC, uh, we've got a public space protection order, we've got a pollinator policy in place, we've got a new cinema that's going to be opening, uh, which was cross-party, but they seem to be disowning it now. And, then, and, and we are just going to say that this is basically uh, delivery in action, not words. Thank you. Thank you, Katharima. And uh, we have a, a question which is going to strain to part two. So at this point, I'll say good night to all those people at home, um, and we will move into part two. Sorry, is it possible to... Yes, and I'll, just to clarify to the public at home that uh, we voted on the fact that if the item was going to move into part two, that we would close the webcast and move into uh, part two, which is now what we're going to do. So, good night, everybody at home.